On a wooden sled designed by his forefathers, a fisherman of Stolfen crosses the mudflats of Bridgewater Bay. It's a three-hour journey which no man of his family has missed for 300 years at low tide. The Selicks, the Brewers, they bear time-honoured names long known among the fisherfolk of Somerset. The framework of their sleds is hung with the simple gear of the shrimp fishers of Stolfen. Their nets stand on a stretch of good holding ground nearly a mile out from the shore. They are stake nets fashioned with wide open heads which act as leaders to the cod's ends or purses anchored astern. The nets are all handmade from good hempen twine and can stand up to 16 or 20 tides without repair. Deep under the living waters, they've taken their harvest from the sea, a harvest which the hands of man now sought out. They throw back the white dog shrimps because there's no market for them, although they are reputed to have the best flavor. Flatfish, too, have no place in their catch. It's a hard-won catch, which they cannot afford to spill during the dangerous journey home over the treacherous mud flats to Stolfen. Over now to Biddingsgate, London's great fish market, where, for as long as anyone can remember, the porters have always worn their distinctive headgear. Nothing much as fashion goes, but a necessary protection against both wet and weight. Bobbins, they're called, and there's a danger that soon they may disappear entirely from the Biddingsgate scene. You'd think there'd always be a demand for bobbins, and so there is. But that's not what worries Master Cordwainer John William Fane. It was he who, in his 250-year-old house in Lovett Lane, behind the market, first saved the bobbin from extinction 25 years ago. Last of the bobbin craftsmen, he was only 20 when he took over their exclusive manufacture. Today, he's worried about the falling demand. Not that Porto's don't want them anymore, but each bobbin has up to 40 years wear in it. Unlike fickle woman, fish porters make one hat last a lifetime. There's another thing. Every bobbin takes a full eight-hour day to make, hardly mass production. Into each one go five pounds of strong leather, six yards of wax end for the hand stitching, and 400 nails. Prices have gone up from 12 shillings in the old days to five pounds ten today. Years ago, trade was lively, and even a visiting Japanese Minister of Fisheries once ordered a special bobbin. Tacking on the three-layer crown that will ease another customer's daily burden, Craftsman John wishes he could do the same for himself. There's a tidy weight on his own mind. Here's a novel way of taking the dog for a walk. Mr. Graham Wallace of Thames Ditton decided that a dog's life just wasn't good enough and designed this sidecar to show them the great big world. It's a bicycle built for three. Mr. Graham, Jip, his Scottish terrier, and Rock the Labrador, with special provision for anything hanging on behind. Everything goes smoothly, and the dogs seem quite at home. At first, Rock jumped out after cats, but he soon learnt how silly that was. Fifteen miles is their longest journey so far, but it's when they arrive that the fun rally starts. Far from depriving them of their walk, they get it in exciting new places. It's an ingenious idea with great possibilities. By its use, Rock and Jip have given new meaning to the expression, lucky dogs. For centuries, great minds have sought the solution of that baffling problem, how did the world begin? Here's one answer. 
The world, or rather the globe, begins with strips of paper pasted onto a round of solid wood. Globe making at a famous Willesden, London firm of geographers. The wooden ball is treated with tallow, which allows each half of the globe to come away a hollow shell of stiff paper. This is stage two of a 15-hour job. Long ago, when the world was thought to be flat, this man would have been punished for an act of heresy. As it is, he continues a complicated craft dating back to 1492, when the first globe was made, also the year Columbus discovered America, not, of course, with a globe to help him. Firmly glued and a good rough proportion, the world in miniature now receives the first of nine separate layers of plaster, built up to a thickness of one-eighth of an inch. Moulding takes about six hours. A fine, smooth surface is imparted by a template. You can't have mountains where nature never put them. You can't have a world without seas and continents either. Once the globe is set and dried, it passes to another department where the business part is pasted on, like restoring the skin to a peeled orange. The coloured printed sections exactly cover the surface. Here, a fraction of an inch out may put you a thousand miles on the wrong side of geographical truth. Globes are printed in all languages. 90% are for export to schools in every country. Worlds going out to the world. Final process is a coat of varnish applied by spray gun. A thousand globes a week leave this factory, all sizes from an inch diameter to five feet. Lucky the globe maker in his job. Willows and hazelnut branches are cultivated in various parts of England for a very special reason. Down in Cornwall, fisherman Bill Butters and his mates put them to good use. They spend most of the winter months making crab pots. They think nothing of walking 12 miles to collect the willow and hazel branches, or withers and nuttalls as they call them in this part of the world. It's a skilled craft, and there is a great demand for the finished pots. The fishermen shoot them into the ocean, 12 miles out, 140 pots at a time, baited with garnet. One good sou'wester may mean the whole 140 lost at one go, and fishermen believe in being prepared. Other districts make their crab pots of steel and various materials, but in Bill's part of the world, they stick to the withers and nut holes. Each pot takes an hour and a half to make and five minutes to lose. This factory down in Hornsey, London, has been in constant production since 1890 and no wonder. For the things it turns out are always in demand. Solid lead ingots are melted, molded and cast. Skilled workers bring all their experience to bear so that each generation of children shall satisfy their fascination for toy soldiers. Women workers take the castings and trim off all superfluous lead so that the model shall be smooth and ready for painting. And this calls for considerable knowledge as well as steadiness of hand and eye. All soldiers of the line have to be finished in correct regimental colours and insignia. Fifty-two million models and medals is the target this year, with many overseas markets to be satisfied. Packing has therefore to be highly practical as well as attractive.
fascinating sight, bringing back memories of many a Christmas and birthday. But children aren't the only customers. Many adults find collecting them an absorbing hobby, combining history and pageantry in miniature. But just the same, the majority are destined for many a hectic battle on hearthrugs the world over. This is a story of friendship, a dear and a postman. Donald Buckingham of Molland, Devon and Ernest. How this eight-month-old dear fawn got his name is a touchy subject, for he's named after a renowned local huntsman, Ernest Borden. While Donald delivers the mail on the morning round, Ernest tags along, picking up whatever's going. He was found by Donald on the moors, motherless, when two days old. Bottle fed on goat's milk, he now takes to a domesticated life with only an occasional excursion into his wild natural state, and then only in passing. One thing about Ernest, he's no trouble to feed, but when it comes to catching him, well, that's quite a different story. Even the local staghounds have been trained to leave him in peace, which all goes to show the importance of being earnest. 